bioluminescence with the mercury. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Good morning from San Diego. Uh, my name is Caitlin. As you know, you've met me many times on here, and we're so excited to talk about the giant kelp forest and some other ocean things this morning with Taylor, a new face for all of you guys. Some of you might have met her at Birch Aquarium before, but Taylor, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at the aquarium? Yeah, of course. So hi, everyone. Again, my name's Taylor. Um, I am one of the instructors at Birch Aquarium in the education department. So we teach all of our K through 12 programming, all of our outdoor adventures, including whale watching and tide pooling. Um, and so kind of do a little bit of everything. So if you've been to Birch, I might have come across you a couple times. Yeah, super fun. Our interpreters are great. And I think it's one of the most fun jobs to have because um, working with our education department, because not only do you get to teach people at the aquarium, but being able to go out in the field and teach people on the whale watching boat or going on a shark snorkel is not only fun for the guests, but I feel like it's really fun for, for us too. <laughs> totally. It's so much fun. Do you I have a program that you like to do the most? Oh, that's such a hard question. I really, really enjoy whale watching. One, just because it's an excuse to get out on the water um, and really just take in all the beautiful sights San Diego has out on the ocean. Um, but also we get to learn about some really awesome animals that migrate right past our coast every year. So it's really cool to talk about. Super cool. Definitely hard because a lot of these sorts of programs are seasonal and we hope to bring them back maybe next season. Uh, but we will see. But this morning, we are excited to talk about our giant kelp forest. I can see from my house in San Diego, I can kind of see where La Jolla is in the distance. And to me, it looks pretty foggy over there still. I don't know if anyone has seen along the coast. It's been very foggy. And so I think we have some very diffused light in our kelp forest today. Uh, Taylor, can you tell us a little bit about how this what makes this tank special or this exhibit special? It's giant kelp needs a few things to help it grow. So yeah, of course. So there's a couple really awesome things about this tank. Specifically, it goes floor to ceiling. Um, so the way to actually enter into the tank and to see the top of the tank, you have to get on the roof. Um, so that means it's open to the sky. So all the light that you see trickling into the tank is not from um, fluorescent light. It's actually any light that we have above us um, from the sun. So um, like Caitlin, you said, it needs sunlight to grow. Um, and so by having open access to the sun, that's what allows our kelp to really thrive in this tank in particular. Oh man, and yes, we do have confirmation that it is foggy in La Jolla. Thank you, Craig, for, for chiming in to let us know. Um, so it's really amazing, this giant kelp forest exhibit, because it holds 70,000 gallons of water. That is a lot. It's our biggest exhibit at the aquarium. And what's really cool is that by checking out the giant kelp forest here, it's just like diving in the giant kelp forest just offshore. So we have a lot of different creatures in here and Taylor and I are gonna be excited to answer your questions about them. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and um, submit those in the comments and also let us know where you're watching from because I know we've had people from all over the country and even the world tuning in. Oh, good morning, Tina. We have a few more people tuning in. Um, so as we get started, I wanted to point out a kind of newer face in this exhibit that um, anyone who has visited Birch Aquarium in the last few months might not have actually seen in this exhibit. And we have a broomtail grouper that we're getting a really good look at in the bottom left corner. The leopard shark just swam past it. Can you see? It's kind of a light colored fish and it has a very wide broom shaped tail. Thus the clever name of broomtail grouper. So um, this is a larger fish in this exhibit and uh, it's pretty cool that this, this animal got moved into the giant kelp forest. So we're happy to see it. Taylor, do you have a favorite fish in our giant kelp forest exhibit? Yes, I'm trying to spot it. So I really like the sheephead. Um, I haven't seen it past the front of the screen just yet, um, but I like it for a couple different reasons. One, I just think it's so fascinating that all sheephead are born female and then partly throughout their lives, they slowly transition into a male. Oh, I see one coming. So it's kind of on the right hand side of the tank. It's going to be going right past the middle. Um, so it's actually oh, yeah, really right cool. there in the middle. Yep, that one. And you can tell is it has a really blunt forehead and um, really defined colors, whereas a female 
won't be quite as big and it'll be more of a pinkish color all throughout. So um, they are one of my favorites and I really like to see them swimming through the, the kelp. Yeah, they're super cool. Can you tell us what to look for <laughs> for the female she had? I know she's a little smaller, but sometimes we can identify her on the on the kelp care. Yeah, I'm trying to see. I don't see her right now. Um, but again, it's going to be a much lighter pink color. It's not going to have those black bars like the male has. Um, and the head won't be as square shaped. It'll be a little bit more elongated. Um, and mm -hmm. I see the male again. But yeah, the female's a little bit trickier for me to spot on the kelp cam. Um, the male is definitely very easily identified. Yeah. And let's see if we can pull up. I just found a picture of a California sheep head. Let's see if we can pull this up on our screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to pull that up from behind right now. But we did um, find a California sheep head photo so you guys can get a close up look of that. And it's in my share screen and we'll get that in in a second. Oh, here we go. That's our California yep. sheep head. I just did a quick Google search for that, guys. That's not an official birch frame, <laughs> but um, it's a really great way to see the markings that Taylor was talking about and that really distinctive white chin. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very cool fish, and they're pretty big. I mean, the females are smaller, but the males. Uh, bigger than my yeah, I think they can get to be up to like 36, 40 inches, um, and the oldest recorded age for a sheep head was about 53 years, which is crazy. Whoa. So they live really long time, yeah. Yeah, for a um, fish, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, and they have really um, interesting teeth. Uh, you can't really see from this photo, but they're mainly um, crushing types of fish. So they eat uh, hard shelled organisms like uh, uh, snails or crabs and things like that. So they need really strong, sharp teeth to kind of crush and force um, to break the shell. Yeah, and we had a great question. Uh, it was either our last cow cam or the one before somebody was asking why don't we have sea urchins in this particular exhibit well one reason is that uh, the sea urchins are voracious eaters and they would eat a lot of our seaweed that we have in there and a lot of our giant kelp um, the other reason is that they are delicious snacks for fish like sheephead uh -huh. so uh, one of the reasons that we don't have sea urchins <laughs> in our giant forest exhibit but we do have them in many other of our southern california exhibits so let's see, you guys are starting to submit some questions. Let's see here. Oh, how about Shirley says, good morning from Lakeside. Are groupers aggressive? I think we were just talking about the broomtail grouper, mm -hmm. which, which spurred that question. Taylor, do you know, are groupers aggressive? There are a lot of types of groupers. Yeah, you know, I'm not so sure. I know aquarists are really good about specifically placing each species of animals in tanks that they know that they'll get along well with with the other animals in there. Um, so just by that, I can probably guesstimate that the broomtail grouper would not be super aggressive um, with these species in particular in the kelp tank. Um, and another thing that Aquarius and um, our husbandry staff really work towards is making sure that they're well fed. So even if they may potentially um, in the wild eat some of these animals, uh, they, you know what, they are fed super well. So they don't really need to be bothered by any yeah. of them. Totally, totally, totally. I know uh, we kind of joke how if I had a buffet being brought to me every day, I probably wouldn't be out, you know, grocery shopping yeah. or cooking for myself. <laughs> if it was brought to me on a silver platter. Um, I do know another fact about groupers is that some groupers can be territorial and they can also be dominant over each other uh, with those territories. So uh, like Taylor was saying, our aquarists have to be smart and very observational of our fish because if you have two groupers that are the same size and all of a sudden one of them's maybe starting to get a little bit more territorial, then it could be a sign that they could be showing aggression or they could try to push each other around a little bit. And, and that's a natural thing. You can think about many animals have different territories or homes that they like to live in. And so it's something we're aware of and often move animals around for that reason. I know that our giant black sea bass, which is not technically the same as a grouper, but that big female that's up in the, oh my gosh, what direction? Top corner <laughs> of the exhibit. Uh, she loves to hang out up there, but She's the only giant black sea bass that we are able to keep in this exhibit because she is territorial and she likes to be the only the only big girl in there. So that was a really great question, guys. We haven't gotten that one before. 
Uh, TB is saying, love the sheep's head. We do too. They're so cool. They're so cool. Oh, and TB followed up with, what do the sheep head eat? What's their favorite food? We touched on that. They love all sorts of crunchy things, delicious things. Mm -hmm. And also sea urchins is another one too. Do they eat squid? I think they'd probably eat squid if we fed them squid in this exhibit, but I don't know if they're chasing down squid in the wild. Definitely. I don't think they really eat squid too much in the wild, um, but they get a, a variety of food in this particular kelp tank. So um, yeah. that's a good possibility. And if you guys are interested, we weren't able to get uh, coordinated this morning, but our Aquarius team are actually going to be feeding the animals in this exhibit a little bit later today. So if you guys feel like tuning in about 12 noon uh, San Diego time, we will have the Aquarists in the exhibit and they will be feeding. And often they're feeding things like chopped up mackerel. They will do uh, squid and capelin is another one. Sounds like Caitlin, I know. But <laughs> capelin is a very popular fish that's fed in aquariums and especially to or places that have mammals uh, also eat a lot of capelin because they have a lot of water content in them and that makes them a very good food. Because you can imagine fish are not necessarily drinking water. They're getting their fresh water content from their food that they're eating. Uh, Vicky is saying, thank you for doing this beautiful, calming and informative. Thank you, Vicky. We're happy to, to be here to answer your guys' questions and talk about the, the kelp forest and beyond. But don't forget, you can always tune into our giant kelp cam at any time at our website. So we can link that in the comments a little bit later on too. But you guys can always tune in. Um, Taylor, speaking of the Zen-like bits of this exhibit, do you know what is it that makes our giant kelp move in this exhibit? Oh, I think this is so cool because it's pretty unique. Um, not many places have this structure that we have, but the way you're kind of seeing the water flow is how it would naturally in the wild with currents and things like that. Um, so to replicate it, we actually have a really gigantic pump at the very top of the tank that's constantly moving up and down and kind of making the water flow just the same way it would um, in all of these animals natural habitat right off of our coastline. So um, this is just another way that we really try to replicate the same kind of environment these species would experience in the wild. So it's really awesome. Yeah. And that flow is definitely important, not just for the animals, but for the giant kelp itself. The giant kelp in, in the west coast of the United States loves the rocky bottom because then it can hold on to the kelp. Taylor, maybe I'll ask you a little bit about how the kelp holds on to the bottom in a little bit. Um, but also that water flow of cold nutrient rich water is very important for the kelp so that it can grow. And I know that kelp can grow really quickly. Taylor, do you know how fast kelp can grow? It is pretty crazy in perfect conditions. So enough nutrients, cold water, bright sunlight, it can go up to two feet a day. So it's really gigantically growing. I always talk about how crazy would that be if every morning you grew, you woke up and were two feet taller. I think that's just insane. Amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing. It's so cool. It's definitely one of the fastest growing uh, plant organisms there is. Mm -hmm. I think there's a type of bamboo that grows similarly, but giant kelp is definitely the fastest growing algae. Mm -hmm. Super cool. And I know that people have asked us before, how does the kelp stick to the bottom? What does it do to, to hold on? And why doesn't it just float away? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, of course. So um, kelp has a lot of structures that kind of look similar to our land plants, our terrestrial plants. Um, and they look a lot like roots, but what we call them is actually a hold fast um, because they hold on really tightly and grip onto a uh, rocky substrate like we have in our kelp tank. Um, and that's because they wouldn't really function well as roots like plants do because all we have on the bottom of the ocean is a lot of sand. So if we, it had a root structure in the sand, um, sand can be really easily moved by water. And so that would that would allow it to kind of float away in the ocean. So um, by attaching itself really strongly to these rocks, um, it is able to hang on tight, especially if there's any storms or strong currents and things like that. Yeah, definitely. And if the kelp does get ripped up, it cannot reattach. Uh, but that's why we see a lot of kelp washed up on the beaches here in on the California coast. And there's actually whole ecosystems on the beach that revolve around eating and living in and being involved with that kelp and seaweed that washes up on the beach. So it's kind of cool when you see those 
big hunks of kelp that's washed up on the beach. I know nerds like us will always kind of dig around and find things. Have you ever <laughs> found anything cool in the kelp washed up on the beach? Oh yeah, I found a whole hold fast. And um, even when hold fasts are attached to rocks, they uh, offer a little bit of a nursery for really small animals. Um, they really like all the nooks and crannies. Um, and so I saw one on the beach and I found some urchins. We found some shark egg cases tangled up into the cool. kelp um, and a lot of little brittle stars. So it was a really cool, cool um, exploration of it. Yeah, those brittle stars are definitely one of the number one things to find in the kelp holdfast. So if you're down at the beach and you find it's kind of looks gnarly, the bottom of the kelp, definitely peek around in there. And brittle stars are neat. They're a type of sea star and they have a central disc and then five really skinny arms that they wave around a lot more quickly than the traditional sea stars that you're used to seeing. So they're pretty fun. Once I found a baby octopus inside oh. a kelp hold fast. I know. Oh my God. So cute. I know. So I took the hold fast that we found it in and I put it in the tide pool. It was very oh. close to the tide pools, but I put it in the tide pool. How cute. Hoping that little baby <laughs> octopus would be in there. Oh, I think we have a bunch more people watching now. Nancy from Arizona. We visit Birch Aquarium every summer. Oh, Nancy, I hope we can welcome you back this summer, but we're still trying to figure out what's happening with this world. <laughs> so um, as, as you can see, Taylor and I are, are working from home and nearly all of our staff are all working from home. As part of UC San Diego, we have extra rules in place in addition to the San Diego and California regulations. But a lot of people have asked us what our aquarists are doing. What, how are we taking care of the fish? Well, they are essential workers and our aquarist team is working in two separate teams that don't interact. Uh, and that way we can ensure that we always have some people available to take care of our animals. And they've been doing a really great job because it's a lot of extra work. And they've also been sending a lot of great things for social media. So thank you, Aquarists. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're not able to, we're not able to be there. Oh, Stephanie's tuning in from Yuma. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for tuning in. Let's see. Gina has a question. How many fish do you have in general? in the giant kelp forest? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, Taylor, do you know how many fish are in there? You know, I'm not sure. I feel like it's constantly changing, so. I agree, I agree. Yeah. And uh, we know that broomtail grouper is new. Mm -hmm. I've heard about 250 to 275 uh, fish in our giant kelp forest exhibit. And some fish like our giant black sea bass, that big girl up there, we have just one of in the exhibit. Um, but others, like I can see near the top, there are a few kelp bass swimming around. Sometimes they're called calico. They kind of look like they have a plaid coloration on their back and a white belly. We got a whole bunch of those in there. So some fish, we have a bunch of them mm -hmm. of one type and some fish, there's just one. I know but there's also a lot of rockfish in there. Um, oh yeah. Rockfish really are really good at camouflaging and they kind of hang around the bottoms or way back against the walls. So they're a little tricky to see from here too. Um, and they're kind of fun to specifically try and find because they're they're kind of hidden in our tank a bit. Right, right. And, and anybody who has uh, been to this exhibit will know, you can, I feel like you can look at the giant kelp forest and think you've seen all the things. And then you blink a few times and you see a few of those rockfish yeah. and go, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize. <laughs> That was an animal there. So they're pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. Uh, let's see. We also have one leopard shark in here. Another one of the creatures we just have one of. And Taylor, can you tell us a little bit about the leopard shark? Of course. So leopard sharks are really special to San Diego in particular because in the wild, we have a whole leopard shark congregation that comes really close to shore during the summertime. Um, and a lot of research has actually been done on leopard sharks by a scientist named Annie Nozal at Scripps, um, mainly trying to figure out why do these awesome sharks come into our shoreline every single year. Um, and he actually figured out that a lot of the a lot of these sharks are female and um, they are actually incubating their pups. So leopard sharks are kind of special in the fact that they don't lay eggs or um, do anything like that kind of typical to sharks. They actually keep it all internal. Um, and by having really warm water that we get in the summer, they're actually able to shorten the amount of time that they are pregnant. 
new leopard shark pups. Um, and so uh, they also come in really shallow waters because they're trying to escape predation from our sea lions. And it's right next to the Scripps Canyon, which is where they do a lot of their feeding. So it's kind of a little bit of everything uh, makes La Jolla Shores a really perfect place for them to hang out um, during the summertime. Yeah, definitely. And if anybody gets an opportunity to snorkel with the leopard sharks, uh, we do highly recommend it. Do some do some research and go with a good company to take you out there. We offer them, but I don't know if we'll be offering them this summer. A few of those things are still up in the air. But do a little bit of research and um, get head out there and see those sharks. They're living actually in a marine protected area, which is really, really cool. Um, Taylor, can you tell us what a marine protected area is? Yeah, so there's a couple different um, types or regulations associated with a marine protected area, but basically the idea of it is to protect either a specific species or the whole area um, and help it to kind of be as strong and fruitful as possible in the environment. So the one that the leopard sharks actually hang out in is a completely no-take marine protected area. So this means that you can't fish in there, you can't take anything you find on the beach, shells or sand, anything like that. Um, and that's really just to make sure that the environment there is as healthy as possible for all the animals that might live there um, so that it, they're a little bit stronger if there's any other stressors that might um, affect them in some way. So the more we can protect them um, under our control, the better they'll be able to withstand other things that might be affecting them in the ocean. Definitely. And those marine protected areas that we have in California, California really is a leader for these. They're kind of like parks under the ocean and, and different ones have different regulations. But California, is it really is a world leader and other countries have looked to California to say, how can we set up our own marine protected areas? And what's really cool is that we've been doing it for long enough that we have seen success and have seen uh, endangered fish populations like the giant black sea bass we have in this exhibit bouncing back slowly, but still little bits at a time. So keeping those whole habitats protected, not just individual animals, really does make a big difference. Really does make a big difference. Um, speaking of our sea bass, Kristen has a question on behalf of Autumn, who is seven. Hi, Autumn. Thank you for watching um, from right here in San Diego. And Anna wants to know why the sea bass likes to stay near the top of the exhibit. Now, Taylor, I feel like I got some inside scoop from our aquarist, Mike, uh, last week about why the giant black sea bass might like to hang out up there. Um, and it was something I hadn't heard of. And he said that area where she's uh, sitting, hanging out right now, it is near the surface of the exhibit. And it's also pretty close to the wave machine. So she might enjoy a little bit of extra oxygenated water, the Ooh. extra movement might feel good on her skin. So the aquarists think that she hangs out there because she likes the feeling of the wave machine on there. But have you ever seen her come further down, Taylor? Yes, I mainly see her come down um, when it's feeding time because she's a big girl. So she likes to eat every single time. You can see her scoop, swim down and scoop up the fish and suck it into her mouth. Um, also, I've been at the aquarium at night a couple times and um, I've often seen her swimming around kind of in the rest of the kelp tank at night, which is yeah. really cool to see. Yeah. and and. For right now, guys, we are running the daytime stream through the evening because like Taylor mentioned before, the giant kelp forest is open at the surface. So at night, we don't really have very many lights that we turn on in there. Plus the fish like to, you know, have a dark evening <laughs> just like we do. Uh, but if you are able to go on early in the morning or kind of a little bit late, like seven, you might see her come down a little bit more. And I saw her actually this morning, I had still had the kelp cam up in another window when I was first checking my emails at 7.30. <laughs> and I saw her, she came down and she was swimming through the kelp and sometimes she'll rub some scratchies on the kelp and then on the rocks on the bottom too. So keep an eye out, she does move around. And a lot of the times we get the question, how much does she weigh? She's like more than 300 pounds. So she's our yeah. biggest fish uh, at the aquarium right now. And she's really cool, mm -hmm. really cool. 
All right, guys. Well, we have gotten a few questions from you guys about the red tide that's going on in San Diego and the bioluminescence. So I did want to take a minute to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen it um, or didn't hear the news, there actually is a red tide event going on in Southern California. It's running from Los Angeles area down through San Diego. And I've actually heard that they're seeing it in Northern Mexico and in Baja as well. And what happens is that in the springtime, there's a lot of nutrients in the water and there's also longer days, which means that some types of plankton that do photosynthesis, plant plankton, is able to bloom very well in the springtime. Now, right now, we're having a special bloom of a type of dinoflagellate, which is a very fancy name for a type of plankton, which likes to bioluminesce. Now, Taylor, can you tell us what is bioluminescence? Yeah, so bioluminescence is really pretty awesome. Um, these organisms that can do it actually create their own light from energy and doing things like photosynthesis. Um, and it's a little bit different than biofluorescence. So biofluorescence, some animals can do as well. And that's more of a light reflection. So bioluminescence, they're creating their own light. It's not, that's why we can see it at nighttime like this. Um, and biofluorescence is kind of a reflection. So they're taking in light that they're receiving and kind of bouncing it off in a different way that gives it a little bit of a different color. But um, red tides are super awesome to see. And it's really interesting because scientists are still trying to figure out how to predict these events. They kind of just appear and we're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I wonder how long it'll be here for. Yeah, so I work closely with the Scripps Oceanography Communications team and in our email, we've been getting a ton of messages from, from news outlets around the world saying, you know, how can we predict this? When is there gonna be another one? How long is this one gonna last? And what's kind of a cool thing about science is we don't have all the answers. And so the answer is, oh, we're not sure. <laughs> we are really lucky that this is going on right now. Um, people might be wondering why does it make sense for this microscopic plankton to light up? Well, animals will bioluminesce or create their own light for many different reasons. And it's most commonly discussed with deep sea animals. Like if you remember in Finding Nemo, the angler fish had the bright light and they're like, oh man, dude, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, they came to. Um, so some animals use bioluminescence to attract food to them that they will try to eat. Some animals use bioluminescence as a way to actually camouflage themselves. They might light up their belly. So any predators that's looking up towards the surface, they're blending in with the sun. Um, another reason that animals will use bioluminescence is as a way to protect themselves. So I like to say, imagine you were gonna eat a chicken nugget and then all of a sudden you're like, here we go, chicken nugget, you're delicious. And you go to take a bite and all of a sudden the chicken nugget starts gl glowing bright blue. And you have no idea. You probably go, oh. <laughs> and not want to eat that chicken nugget. Uh, well, that is exactly what this plankton is doing. Anytime the plankton gets stirred up in the water a little bit, it goes, oh my gosh, and it lights up bright blue because it gets a little bit scared. Um, if this plankton is in the open ocean, it might not have to bioluminesce or light up quite as much. But when these big plankton blooms reach the shore, as the ocean waves are crashing, you're seeing them get agitated and lighting up bright blue in a tiny little panic. So <laughs> it's pretty yeah. amazing to see. And I know here in San Diego, some of the beaches are open and there are some places and some people heading out to see it. Please, please, please make sure that you are following any of the local rules and regulations when it comes to going to the beach and all of the social distancing rules if you are planning to go out to try to see it. And people have been uh, messaging us saying, where do I go? Where's the best place? What do I do to see it? And though we are not encouraging people to go, if you are going to try, you need to go someplace that's very dark. So, you know, find a dark place. Mm -hmm. But and there are also some places you yeah. can see it from your car, which is nice too. Yeah, there's a lot of cliffside um, beaches that you can drive to and stay in your car so you'd be following all regulations and you can still see the water from there. So those are good spots too. Yeah, and so some people are asking, um, is it safe for the fish? What's going on with your exhibits with it? Uh, there are many different types of dinoflagellate plankton, like a lot. 
And so some types can be toxic. And I know that we've heard about big plankton blooms and red tides that happen in the Gulf of Mexico and in Florida, which have a lot of impacts on things like manatees and dolphins. Uh, and uh, many of the fish, they cause fish die-offs there as well. That's because that particular type of dinoflagellate actually creates a type of toxin to help protect itself that is within the water and usually in the surface, the air just at the surface of the water, which is why it makes it pretty dangerous for dolphins and manatees. Uh, we used to go to Florida a lot when I was a kid and we would have, um, a lot of people would cough because even those toxins would blow in from the ocean. The dinoflagellate blooms that we have here are different than the ones that you hear about on the East Coast in Florida. So uh, this one is not a toxic bloom. It just looks a little bit ugly during the day. You might notice the ocean has a red tinge to it, a reddish brown coloration. Um, and that is literally, there's so much plankton in the water. It's dyeing the ocean reddish. And then um, at night, it'll light up when it gets agitated. So there are many types of plankton this one's okay, it just lights up. And actually it's providing a ton of food for other types of plankton like zooplankton or animal plankton. How many times can I say plankton in this <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we could probably talk about plankton yeah. in the face. Uh, let's see if anybody asked us more questions about our giant kelp forest. Let's see. Oh, Diana and Vista says, hello, hello, hello. Oh, oh, thank, and Marcos uh, says, greetings from Escondido, love the chicken nugget analogy. Thank you, Marco, or Marcos, when you teach in the classroom with little kids for a long time. You I'm start using that one. Trail, you know. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, trying to teach bioluminescence to four-year-olds is sometimes a challenge, but I'm glad mm -hmm. you guys appreciate it too. Oh, so Gina has a follow-up question. Can you put bioluminescence on you? Like you're going to a, a rave or something like that. <laughs> to glow on your face? Um, no, you could go. Do not go swimming. But if animal, if you're on the sand and you see it in the water, I've been on the beach before. This was years ago for one of our grunion runs that we did. Taylor, you've done grunion runs before, right? Yeah, you know you're a pro. Um, grunion are a type of fr fish that come up on the beach. In, in California to lay their eggs at night. And there was once a bioluminescent event, a red tide event at the same time as the Grunion Run. So our whole group of people, of our guests from the aquarium, we were down on the beach watching the Grunion come up to lay their eggs in the sand. And everywhere you walked in the sand, if you were in the wet sand, lit up blue. It was like that Avatar movie. It wow. was crazy. We were all like running around like little kids making blue footprints wherever we went. So you can't really put it on your body, but you can interact with it in interesting ways. Yeah. And I think the reason it doesn't really work on your body is because since it's in water, it, you really need a lot of it to get that color. Yeah. So even if you had like touched the water during the gun grunion runs or something, there wouldn't be enough on your hands to really give you that bright blue color. It really has to be in a body of water. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that they can't really light up for a super extended period of time. As you can imagine, these are microorganisms. They are teeny, 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 tiny. And so when they flash, they flash blue for maybe a second or two, and then they're done and they have to take a little break. So you can imagine how many millions have to be out in the ocean water to have entire waves light up like this. Um, and I encourage you guys to Google it. Uh, there's a really cool video going around from Newport of somebody out at night and there are dolphins swimming through the bioluminescence. My head would explode. That would be the coolest thing. It would be so cool. <laughs> it would be so cool. Very cool. Oh, Paul, who's writing in said he did research on these guys at Scripps in 1974. Oh, We're probably awesome. still referencing a lot of the amazing research that you did then. Thanks, Paul. Um, I know that another Scripps researcher who is really an expert in bioluminescence is Michael Latz. And he has been emailing uh, within the Scripps community talking about updates with this with this bloom. And we actually did have an exhibit called the Infinity Cube, which was the intersection of bioluminescent plankton, science, and art all together yeah. in a funky <laughs> installation. I don't know, Taylor, how would you describe it? Kind no, like pretty that. much exactly that. A little bit of everything. It yeah, was let's so know cool. the comments if you went to the Infinity Cube. It was cool. <laughs> it was yeah. very cool. 
Oh, and we have Paul is writing in from Copenhagen. Hello. How cool. Thank you for tuning into the kelp cam and checking out our giant kelp forest this morning. Let's see. Not too many questions about our giant kelp forest. I think we're all very excited about the bioluminescence right now. Oh, Andy Chang says it's a beautiful morning in the kelp forest today and the animals do look super active and happy. That I would say they are looking very content this morning. I would agree, Andy. And what's pretty cool is we've actually gotten some questions about do the animals realize that people are not there? I don't know. Taylor, have you heard anything about the the animals changing their behavior at all? Yeah, so we've been noticing a little bit of both. So some of the really social animals that we have at the aquarium, for example, our sea turtle um, and other animals that really feed off of interaction with people, um, they're maybe getting a little bit more lonely. So the aquarists have said that they've been hanging out with them, trying to give them a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention. And then we other have we also have a lot of other animals that are pretty shy. So those animals that are normally hiding and a little bit more shy, um, we're seeing come out and come out of their shells and, and being a little bit more active in the tank. So it's really cool to um, see a little bit of both of that happening. Yeah, definitely. And one of my uh, favorite ones is that our giant Pacific octopus, she is very social. We have, uh, you know, giant Pacific octopus, they live about three years uh to five years in captivity but in the wild about three years and our girl right now she is big and active and is used to having guests there to kind of look at and interact <laughs> with and so our aquarist team has been doing extra activities with her behind the scenes and, and giving her a little bit of extra love they always every day play with our giant pacific octopus for enrichment because she's so smart and she needs some play time uh you can't just leave her in there by herself so she always had puzzle toys or frozen treats or jars that she has to open, uh, but she's getting some extra play time and some extra love because of, because of all of this quietness mm -hmm. going on in the Hall of Fishes. It's um, fun to think that you can play with an octopus. Oh yeah, it's so, it's crazy. so cool. It's so amazing. And I like kind of joke sometimes, like I used to eat octopus, but now I can't eat octopus. <laughs> because she's so cool, Aww. she's like a dog. <laughs> she has a lot of personality. Um, and I know we have a fun fact video about our giant Pacific octopus that you can check out on our YouTube page. But then we also, I think we're working on another octopus video right now. So there might be another one coming down the pipeline soon. Let's see, we've had a few questions about otters so far. Uh, Gina wants to know, can we show the otters? Well. Unfortunately, Gina, we do not have any otters or any mammals besides staff at Bridge Aquarium at Scripps. So we're not going to be showing any otters today. Uh, but sea otters are an important member of the kelp forest community. And they are found much more so up in northern California and central California. There are some otter reserves there. And then there is a small population of otters that were reintroduced in Southern California off of Catalina Island and the islands up there. Um, unfortunately, that population has just kind of stayed steady at like nine or 10 otters and they're not really reproducing all that much. So in Southern California, really the, the only wild otters you're gonna see here these days are, are around the Channel Islands, but I've seen them before up in the Central Coast of Northern California, they are very cute. Although I think the best place to see them is probably Alaska. There's a lot of otters. <laughs> Taylor, do you have any uh, sea otter fun facts? Um, I one I, I think everyone can agree. They are so adorable. Um, and I feel like whenever you search up sea otters, you see those cute photos where they're like rubbing their face or like fluffing their fur. Um, and that is actually for a pretty specific reason. They're trying to make sure that their fur is really nice and full of little air pockets um, because that's what keeps them warm. So they're not like a lot of marine mammals that have blubber. They really rely on that thick, thick fur to keep them super warm. So that's why they're constantly grooming and fluffing. And that's why they look so, so cute, I think, is because they're trying to fill their fur full of those little pockets of air. Yes, and the baby otters, they float like a cork because their moms are always grooming them constantly. So um, cute. My favorite sea otter fun fact is that they have huge armpits. 
<laughs> and they have really big armpits because just like when you are in school or at work and you have a favorite pen as the tool that you like to use or your favorite notebook, otters will keep their favorite rock or their rock of the day that they've enjoyed using to help crack open clams and urchins and other snails and gastropods and things that they find along the seafloor. They'll pop back up to the surface with it, whack, whack, whack it with the rock, open it up, but then they don't want to just toss the rock and have to find another rock with their food. So they just stick it in their really big armpits and swim down and get it again. It's like having a big pocket. It's just your armpit. So anyway, nature's crazy, guys. Yeah. I also I also really think it's so funny that um, sea otter moms actually use kelp as seatbelts for their pups. So every time they need a, the mom needs to go get some food or go something, they don't want their their pup just floating away on the water. So they use all that extra kelp and kind of wrap them up like a seatbelt so that they don't float away. I just think that's so adorable. (laughs) That is really adorable. Kelp, good for many things. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just got a quick notification that says that giant Pacific octopus enrichment video uh, is going to be posted next Monday. So make sure you're following along on Facebook and Instagram and subscribed on YouTube. That's a big one now. Uh, We have a lot of great new videos going up, three new ones a week. So pretty cool. All right, guys. Well, we are going to wrap up in just a few minutes. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in and to who has been watching. Just a quick reminder that at noon today, Pacific time uh, here in San Diego, our Aquarius team are going to be hopping into this exhibit to feed the fishes. We weren't able to coordinate it to get it at the same time as our live stream today, but you'll see at least one diver likely to go into the exhibit to feed the fish. So that'll be a really, really fun thing to tune into uh, while you're having lunch, if you're local, uh, to see our fishes have lunch. And I think you'll get a better look at our giant black sea bass. She's been napping up top for for a while. Um, Anyway, Taylor, is there anything else you want to add about the kelp for us before we sign off? I'm just so glad that we finally have some new kelp in there. Yeah. I was watching the past couple weeks and I was like, oh man, I hope we can go collect some soon. Um, And I feel like it just adds a lot to the to the whole atmosphere of the tank, being able to see the kelp sway like that. So I'm really happy that we were able to go and get some more. Yeah, I agree. And and for anyone who's wondering, we have uh, special permits to collect a certain amount of kelp from very specific areas offshore here in San Diego. And we use it in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways is as habitat in this giant kelp forest exhibit and in some of our other ones. And many times our Aquarius team is just going and cutting off the top of some kelp. And as Taylor told us, it grows really fast. So usually within just a few days, that kelp has grown back up to its original height. Um, Another reason we collect kelp is because many of our animals actually eat kelp. So things like the sea urchins, the abalones, our wavy top turban snails, many different animals eat the kelp at Birch Aquarium as well. So not only do we collect it with those special permits for the exhibits, but also for lunch for some creatures. <laughs> Very cool. All right, Taylor. Well, thank you so much for coming on with us today. It was great to hear your perspective on a lot of this really cool stuff. And for all of you who tuned in from all over the world, thank you so much. And we will be back this Thursday at 2 Pacific time uh, to talk a little bit more about the giant kelp forest with another special guest. So thanks, you guys. Have a yeah. great one. Thank you.